Hey guys, it's your girl Sage. I hope you're having a wonderful day or night whenever this video finds you. I'm here with our daily bread and for today we have Ezekiel chapter 7. Judgment on Israel is near. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will repay your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, a disaster, a singular disaster, behold, it has come. An end has come, the end has come, it has dawned for you, behold, it has come. Doom has come to you, you who dwell in the land, the time has come, a day of trouble is near, and not of rejoicing in the mountains. Now upon you I will soon pour out my fury and spend my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will repay you according to your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who strikes. Behold, the day, behold, it has come. Doom has gone out. The rod has blossomed. Pride has budded. Violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, none of their multitude, none of them, nor shall there be wailing for them. The time has come, the day draws near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is on their whole multitude. For the seller shall not return to what has been sold, though he may still be alive, for the vision concerns the whole multitude. And it shall not turn back, no one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. They have blown the trumpet and made everyone ready. <laughs> but no one goes into battle, for my wrath is on all their multitude. The sword is outside, and pestilence and famine within. Whoever is in the field will die by the sword, and who whoever is in the city, famine and pestilence will devour him. Those who survive will escape and be on the mountains, like doves on the valley, all of them mourning each for his iniquity. Every hand will be feeble, and every knee will be as weak as water. They will also be girded with sackcloth. Horror will cover them. Shame will be on every face, baldness on all their heads. They will throw their silver into the streets, and their gold will be like refuse. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them. In the day of the wrath of the Lord, they will not satisfy their souls, nor fill their stomachs, because it became their stumbling block of iniquity. As for the beauty of his ornaments, he said it in the majesty, or he said it in majesty, but they made from it the images of their abominations, their detestable things. Therefore, I have made it like refuse to them. I will give it as plunder into the hands. Excuse me. I will give it as plunder into the hands of strangers and to the wicked of the earth as spoil, and they shall defile it. I will turn my face from them, and they will defile my secret place, for robbers shall enter it and defile it. Make a chain. For the land is filled with crimes of blood, and the city is full of violence. Therefore, I will bring the worst of the Gentiles, and they will possess their houses. I will cause the pomp of the strong to cease, and their holy places shall be defiled. Destruction comes, they will seek peace, but there shall be none. I'm so sorry, excuse me guys. Disaster will come upon disaster, and rumor will be upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. The king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the common people will tremble. 
I will do them according to their way, and according to what they deserve, I will judge them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. All right. So um, reading this chapter, it sounds almost as if the Lord has had his, is at his ends wrote when it comes to uh, the Israelites um, from the Old Testament here. He is speaking, and actually we kind of already can see what he's speaking about here with his um, frustrations with, um, with Israel in this case, in this chapter. Um, we see in uh, Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 10. Um, behold, the day, behold, it has come. Doom has gone out. The rod has blossomed. So right there, um, it's also kind of quickly touching on the fact that the Lord, his anger is very slow to form. He's very patient with us and wanting us to repent. Again, he's not slow in keeping any of his promises, good or bad, but rather patient with us, wanting us to repent and change our ways. Um, and, but here's the thing, he can only give us warning and instruction and guidance so many times. Um, but right here with the rod has blossomed when using that, that language right there blossomed, it makes us think about a plant. And if you've ever grown plants or you work with plants, I have a bunch of ferns on my front porch actually, but you see that it takes time for them to grow. It takes time for them to develop the stem, the pistil, the flower. It, it takes time for all of that. And for the rod has blossomed. It, it That imagery right there is that the flower has come to full fruition. Um, and also right here, right after that, pride has budded. Violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. So right there... It's something that's been growing for a long time. And the thing about the Lord is he is patient with us, but he also warns and guides us. And it's when we shut our ears to his instruction and guidance, that's when we're hardening our hearts towards him um, and choosing sin and iniquity over him and his guidance. Um and, and I'm just speaking this, uh, again, from the imagery that um, we're receiving here from that verse. Um, and he's also mentioning it a couple of times. I will repay you according to your ways. Um, so again, he's given his people chance and opportunity to change their ways, yet they've still chosen their own ways of wickedness and their own paths of violence and pride and hurting one another for their own selfish gain. And I'm saying that last part right here because right here in um, Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 19, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go with the second half of 19 um, only because this is what, what caught my attention. In the day of the wrath of the Lord, they will not satisfy their souls nor fill their stomachs because it became their stumbling block of iniquity. So right there that he just said, nor fill their stomachs. So their food has become their stumbling block of iniquity. Um, saying that, of course, food um, is representing of their material wealth. Because again, especially back in the older days when somebody was um, largely overweight, it actually indicated a um, it indicated wealth of some sort or uh, greed in some cases as well for having so much excess food and excess finances to be able to splurge, especially on the more choice morsels of food that that um, would represent, again, having more money. Um, and so right there nor fill their stomachs because it became their stumbling block of iniquity, it indicates a sense of selfishness from his people. Um, again, not helping the widows, not helping the fatherless, you know. And the thing is, the Lord does command us to love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, but also to love him and to have the love that the Lord has for us within us as well would also indicate us a presenting of fruits by offering that love to others in need as well. Um, and the Lord is actually very big on charity as well. Um, in the official King James Version, it's not the word love that's officially used, but charity. But um, And those words being interchangeable, it's having that display of love for even a stranger because, again, we see 
that that stranger is a child of the Lord. The Lord created that stranger that is in need of help. Um, and we also see, um, not to go too much off subject, but in the book of Revelations, where, or I'm sorry, maybe not the book of Revelations, excuse me. I want to say maybe the book of Matthew, where Jesus is talking about um, how the day of judgment, the Lord He's going to separate us into two groups. There's going to be sitting at his um, right hand, the flock of sheep who he rewards because, again, they've they've taken care of him. And they'll say, Lord, we don't remember taking care of you. And he'll say, you're the one that visited me in prison when I was alone. You were the one that when I was sitting on the street hungry, offered me food. Meanwhile, the goats, on the other hand, um, he's going to separate them as well, saying, depart from me. You never came for me when I was in prison. You never came for me when I was hungry on the streets for food. You never helped me then. So the Lord is very big on us being charitable and hospitable to one another. Um, and not even so much being good to others that are good to us, because even sinners do that. But to the stranger that we don't know and that we have no right to project judgment upon because very easily, if it is the Lord's will, he can easily reverse our places with that stranger. And then it's us sitting on the streets asking for money. So that's why the Lord also commands us to love one another as as we love ourselves, as we love our family, um, because in his eyes, we are all family in his eyes. We are all connected because he is our heavenly father. So again, it's um, this chapter is a reflection of a lot of their selfishness. But then they take it another step further and they create these abominations. And we know that in the commandments that the Lord specifically gives us instruction to not create images of heaven. Um, now I want to touch on something really quick. I'm sure many of you have noticed I have that picture of Jesus going to hug somebody in the background. Yes, I have pictures of Jesus and I love them. Um, Jesus was here on earth and he walked among us and people, many people saw his face in the Bible. He is not described as anybody with a, an outstandingly different appearance than the common man at the time. Um, and I'm mentioning all this because his imagery, he is in heaven right now, setting a room for us. You know, he, he promises us this, um, under the new covenant that's formed through his blood, you know, um, the covenant of forgiveness through receiving him as our Lord. And, um, uh, because receiving him as Lord also reflects that we trust in him, that he is speaking from the fact that he is of the Lord, that he is from the Lord, and that he wants us to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father and to believe in him. And that's what the Lord wants from us. Um, and that's why, of course, he sent us his His beloved and begotten son, Jesus. Um, but I wanted to touch on that because uh, it, I know it's been described as a bit of a Catholic thing, if you will. Um, and I'm simply bringing it to attention because, again, the Lord has... Jesus has walked with us. He's walked here on earth and he's also ascended to heaven. But having his picture is the equivalent of having a photo of somebody who is no longer with us, who's gone into the deep sleep, maybe perhaps a beloved family member. Um, so I'm separating this because again, Jesus was here with us. These abominations that the Lord is talking about have been fashioned from inspired images of heaven that have not graced this earth. So simply put, it's, it's these abominations are his people's attempt to take what he's created, um, essentially speaking, and bringing it down for themselves. It's, it's a mockery to what the Lord creates. Um, cause also we have, uh, something called biblically accurate angels, if you will. Um, there's been a lot of them that's been, that's been, um, uh, popping up and they're taken from scripture within the Bible. That is, um, the, the, um, author of that book attempting to describe what it is that they're seeing. Um, and that's us trying to interpret what it is that we're seeing. 
However, these abominations, it actually goes into more detail in the next chapter, Ezekiel chapter 8, um, that these abominations, uh, it's, it, it's almost as if they're made from what man's idea of what God's heavenly creation should be. And by doing that, now we're limiting our Heavenly Father's abilities. And by doing that, we're putting him in a box. And by putting him in a box, it means that we are not able to understand that he is Lord God, creator of all things. He is the one in control of all things. Um, so really, it's it's almost like ripping off some of the things that he's created and then saying, Oh yeah, this this is um what the Lord made, and the Lord goes, I never signed off on that. So that's essentially um why these abominations are so detestable um, before His eyes, and uh, so it's it's an insult also to bring them into His holy temple where He's already carefully designed His holy temple. We can see that all the way back in, um, I want to say in Leviticus. Where he's just, um, no, that's the tabernacle, excuse me. Um, that's the tabernacle. I want to say, was it in Deuteronomy? Nonetheless, it was during the time when the Israelites had left Egypt and they're in the wilderness. It's in that transition as they're entering their promised land. The Lord gives them very specific instructions to follow. And he does describe um, Cherubim that he wants in the temple, but none of these abominations that we find in the temple in the book of Ezekiel are anything that he asked his people to create or design. Um, so again, it's, it's humans attempting to forge their own way of God. They're attempting to forge their own God, and this is leading into a sense of idolatry. So that's where the Lord's um, anger comes in as well. And that's why, of course, we also know that when we continually choose to persist in our sin, the Lord gives us free will and he will hand us over to our sin. Um, and we also know that the wages of sin are death. So in this case, he's willing to hand his people over to their sin and by doing that, what it's what it's doing is it's placing them in a place of weakness to their sin. Again, he sends famine and pestilence to those in the city who, you know, those who are selfish and depending upon their food, but they're to the point where they're not helping others. They're simply more concerned with filling their pockets. And in some cases, they're even willing to resort to violence and their own arrogance um, to continue that instead of helping somebody in need. Um, but then also those outside of the city will fall to the sword um, of, a, of um, the Gentiles that he's going to send their way. Um, and, and that's kind of making it more horrifying in itself because it's showing that um, there's just really um, hardly any chance to escape. And it's only those that are actually actively seeking the Lord that are going to have that opportunity to escape. And even then they'll be left with horror and shame covered in sackcloth for their people. Um, Cause this is quite a horrifying event that the Lord is describing to us here. Um, so that's why it's so important that, you know, we rejoice in the fact that we have the Lord Jesus. We rejoice in the fact that through him, we can receive forgiveness of um, of our sins, whether we've received him a long time ago, maybe in our childhood, or maybe we've been born again and just received him perhaps even in the last month. Nonetheless, you know, to be, to be thankful for the Lord's mercy, that the Lord loves us so much that he gave us his only begotten son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But by receiving him as their Lord, confessing with their mouth, and believing with their heart that he is Lord, that we receive the gift of salvation and that relationship with the Lord, you know. Um, and part of having that relationship with the Lord, when you have a relationship with anybody, you you learn them, you get to know them better. You know, you you spend time with them. And as you spend time with them, you, you learn the things that they like, the things that they dislike. You learn 
how you play a part in your relationship with them. You learn who you are with them, you know, and that's why it's so important that, that yes, receiving the blood of Jesus, because that is our only, only salvation. It's not our works, you know, nothing that we do. Our, our good works are as good as filthy rags, you know, but through the blood of Jesus, we are given a chance to be renewed and made righteous before the eyes of the Lord and to have that relationship with him. And it's also through Jesus that we receive guidance and instruction on who it is that the Lord always called us to be. And it's up to us to use that free will of ours to forsake our wicked ways of greed and filling our pockets and, and hoarding material goods here for ourselves when there's others in need who, who the Lord created that we're all equal to. None of us are better than another, you know, and for us to even think so is just simply deceiving ourselves. So in any case, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up here. If you guys enjoyed, feel free to like, subscribe, and until next time, I hope all y'all take care. Bye-bye!